An introduction to myself. Um, I'm sure most of you know who I am. My name's Alex Harris. I'm the ex-CFI of uh, Essex Gliding Club. I did that for about three years. I'm a BI coach, so examining BIs. Um, I'm an advanced aerobatic instructor for gliding. I'm also an FI aerobatic for single engine piston aeroplanes. Um, I hold a DA um, for display flying with aerobatics and formation. And uh, my day job is flying a 737 for a European airline. But uh, tonight I'm here to talk to you about aerobatics and the experiences. Um, I first started aerobatics, oh, I don't know, 2013 earlier than that, I think probably about 2010, had my first taste of aerobatics and progressed from there. I was very fortunate enough to fly a, a world championships, won, won national championships in the UK. Um, and I'm really here tonight to try and share the pertinent points coming out of a theoretical brief or the points that you need to be um, more aware of going into your aerobatic flying and into whatever career you have in aerobatics. I'm going to make... Um, I'm going to make I'd be quite weary not to dither too much on the uh, real hard theoretical side of this. This is really for something you do with a coach or with an instructor when you're uh, next able to go flying with them. Uh, and I'm sure you're all fairly theoried out at the moment um, with uh, what you've had so far over lockdown. So I'm going to try and make this as fun and sort of informative as possible, um, but also, you know, being able to take home some fairly important facts of uh, flying aerobatics. So why fly aerobatics? I know it's a question that a lot of people ask at clubs. Um, precision flying, it's very nice to be able to know that you're still able to control an aeroplane as maybe as effectively as you were when you first went solo. Uh, and understanding the the envelope of the aeroplane, it's often very, I've, I've certainly flown with lots of people who haven't quite got a complete grasp as to what gliders and, and air, fixed wing airplanes can do uh, and just going back a bit i am going to try and make an interlude for the guys that are here that do fly powered aerobatics um as a powered fi or a powered aerobatic fi i'm going to try and help sort of cross cut between the two with the you know focusing more on um glider aerobatics um but precision flying and understanding the the aircraft's envelope is a big one so you know i often fly with lots of guys in gliders who don't maybe understand what they could do or maybe think you know a fairly abrupt bump going up a winch launch is going to damage the aircraft and actually showing them aerobatics if they've got no interest in competition is is quite a good way to give them an understanding of of how airplane or of the 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 way that airplanes can deal with things um pre-bronze it's a good one for that i've got a few um people at my uh club that i was cfi at that um were sort of at the pre-bronze phase could you know not quite 16 couldn't quite progress the way they wanted to go and, and aerobatics was a good route to go you're able to get the the rating you're able to start training uh for maybe a beginner's level aerobatic competition so it's quite a good way of coming into sort of sport gliding i like to say is going into the sort of you know if you choose to go racing choose to go aerobatics it's a good way for the younger people to actually get a taste of um of having a point to their flying very early on uh, improved handling skills, yeah, it really comes above with the uh, precision flying. It greatly improves your handling skills. Um, one of the first things I ask with with guys that I'm flying with, that you know, certainly on biannuals in the power world, if I'm flying with someone to renew a rating, it's the first thing I ask you done in the aerobatics because the the handling skills and what you can expect of the pilot or the person you're training. Uh, I've not really flown with one non aerobatic pilot he hasn't got you know the remnants of a very good um set of hands and feet so it does drastically improve your handling skills thus improving your handling skills when you're put under stress um so if you've got a high workload situation in the circuit whether something's wrong with the aircraft whether something's you know happening outside you're able to you know try and sort of fall back on that handling skill that you have so it does boost your capability to to fly as a whole with the threat and management and the uh uh, airmanship skills that go with general handling and again leads nicely on to improving TEM uh, awareness um, it's a, a bit of a myth really that you know it's, I'm going to mention it a bit later on I've you know the association of anti-aerobatic pilots at gliding clubs seem to be uh, quite hot in fruition at the moment but um, it's important to people to understand that actually going through the right process of, of learning aerobatics your tem ability 
you know, people probably knew that as airmanship in the past, but threat and error management ability, you know, what's going to go wrong? How am I going to prevent it from going wrong? Um, through your sort of theoretical briefings and maybe case studies, learning to fly aerobatics definitely enhances that knowledge for you. Discipline. I really like this one. I, I'm big on the discipline with aerobatics. If you're going to fly aerobatics, it's important that we don't play into the hands of the people that think we're out there for aerial hooliganism uh, and all the ladies and the girls. Um, we're not, you know, we're out there to do something we enjoy precisely improve the handling skills everything i've listed above and i think it's very important to have that discipline with aerobatics a disciplined hard deck a very disciplined circuit um it's just very important to have all those things to maintain that precise good handling skills maintain that good tm it's very important to have a discipline on your flying and again if you're having some younger people in uh, in aerobatics as cfis and instructors it's very nice to see that level of uh tm airmanship from a very early onset so hopefully it sets them up very nicely for their career whether they go into to aerobatics or not um competition um again you can fly lots of competitions the baa we're going to mention uh in a bit obviously you know last year during during covid probably not a lot had to happen um but yeah competitions um if you're interested in competing uh, even at beginners level so when you do your um rating with a coach we're going to talk a bit, a bit later about um you know you can compete at any level <clears throat> whether it be beginner right through to unlimited so um it is possible uh, to compete you know fairly early on in your aerobatic career and it gives some meaning to your flight it kind of clarifies what i said earlier um you know, for these younger guys that, you know, are just able to local soar for a while, um, for people that, you know, maybe have got a bit sick and tired of doing the Club 100K or something, you know, it gives a bit more meaning to your flying is to be able to go out and fly uh, a sequence, fly, and you know, anything precisely and come down and feel like you've achieved something out of the flight. It's very important to have that. Uh, and I think it's the key to sort of not getting bored with anything you're doing in life, really. So it gives some meaning to your flying. So getting started in, in aerobatics, talk to your club CFI and instructors. That's really important. So talk to your club CFI as a matter of protocol, really, is the first person you go to. They'll probably direct you to your club instructors. Um, again, just like to emphasize, most instructors will have the aerobatic capability. However, you know, not all instructors want to slash have the qualification. So um, all full cats at the moment will have the uh, aerobatic instructor qualification, whatever level you'll have to ask them, but all of them will, whether they want to or not is another thing. Um, but hopefully your club does have some as cats or full cats that are able to go and teach you aerobatics. So the first protocol is to teach your CFI, talk to your CFI, sorry. Um, they'll give you some advice and then go and talk to your club instructors or they can point you in the director of a, of a club instructor start your aerobatic journey with a standard badge so that's what you basically it's very easy to get going talk to your, your cfi get your instructor and start your aerobatics with a standard aerobatic badge we're going to talk about a bit later if no aerobatic fi exists in your club contact the bj for the nearest club with an aerobatic fi um yeah there are a few around. There are lots around. I feel a bit sorry for the full cats because they're automatically being given this rating when, you know, some of them maybe feel a bit pressured to go and do aerobatics. That's not the case. So, you know, don't be don't be upset if you find a full cat that won't go and do any aerobatics with you. Um, there might be an, an ASCAT somewhere in the club that, that will be more than happy. But if there's none that exist, contact the BGA um, for the nearest club with an aerobatic FI. I, I mean, I live in sort of Suffolk direction. Again, I'm more than happy to come and help anyone that's, you know, in need of a aerobatic instructing at whatever level, really. Um, be aware of the association of anti-aerobatic flying within clubs. There's a lot of that around. And, um, you know, it's it's very difficult for a, a young person. You also, when you're flying aerobatics as a young person, you have to put a separate hat on. Um, and it's, you know, you have to do that as a, as a young person, as a, a you know, a person of age you have to also avoid these people because they're got under the illusion that you know aerobatics is just for you know hooligans that are and going to end up in a steaming hole one day but you know as i've hopefully just said to you it's it, the, the importance of discipline in aerobatic flying because of the nature of what you're doing is so so important so there are people that you know will try and tell you that aerobatics is dangerous that aerobatics isn't you know 
part of gliding well prove them wrong make make them aware you know if you've got these people in your club they need to to get cross with them but you know sit them down show them every bit of aerobatic theoretical briefing all the standard stuff that we do um and you know although you don't have anything written down with safe execution of all the rest of the flying you know you can show them through the flying you know when you go fly have a absolutely defined cut off hard deck brief the people that you're supposed to brief brief the duty instructor brief everyone around the airfield and show these people that actually you know aerobatics is 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 just a different discipline of flying and should be treated equally as cross country flying really um i like to enjoy them both um but you know there are a lot of people around that will try and put you off it so my biggest advice to you is to you know crack on i'm always available you've got my contact number down here if there's any issues with that at all um please don't hesitate to let me know and i can do my best to help you with it but um yeah my key advice there would be give them no reason to to believe that it's dangerous anything you're doing so your kind of standard aerobatic badge which constitutes your um sfcl aerobatic rating at the moment is a theory briefing to start with a 45 degree diving line as part of the flying a loop a chandelle positive humpty bump we'll talk about in a minute 270 degree turn and a 45 degree climbing line so that's kind of the, the standard level as to which to base yourself on the next level to go up to is sports um but yeah six figures there in your uh, standard aerobatic badge of the beginner's sequence if you like uh, one of which is basically just a turn uh, and another two figures is a climbing and a diving line uh, and like i say we're, we're not looking for perfect certainly when i'm looking at someone doing a, a badge flight i you know i don't really mind if they fall out of every figure if they you know stall in the loop they stall in the shundell positive humpty bump they tail slide it's really all about how they recover from it and the the safety aspects to to what they've done you know have they done it safely have they executed proper airmanship proper tem um and you know what was the outcome of it so although they they may have got it wrong how safe was the pilot and in fact i i prefer with every bit of instructing i'm doing i prefer to watch someone get it wrong and watch how they deal with it they've got the added stress of me being in the back and they're also on a test you know sometimes with examining it's very good for me to be able to see how they react with that two added pressures one of me being in the back two they're getting it wrong i'd rather see that and then correctly execute it because then you know when they're on their own with zero stress they're likely to to be much better anyway so i usually get a bit worried when someone absolutely aces a standard aerobatic badge at sports you know whatever test i'm doing um it's always slightly concerning so yeah takeaway from that is make sure you know it's just safely executed um and you know don't worry about it being a world championship flying flight so we're gonna have a go on to um have a chat about the sort of pertinent points to um the theory briefing in a minute i'm not going to give you the entire theory brief because it takes quite a long time and you know the last thing you guys want is uh, to go back to more theory um, so I've pulled out the really pertinent points that I think are quite important to aerobatics and the rest, you know, the uh, you can talk through your club coaches when you get to it. Um, and the last thing you've really got to think about here is the um, hassle check uh, for gliding. And we're going to come on to that in a minute. So theory briefing points. So importance of pre-flight preparation. That's really, really important. Um something having been to both power and or teaching in both power and gliding it's 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 quite interesting to see the divide of people that will watch videos will do walkthroughs don't throw endless amounts of money at their flying and the people that do throw any amount, endless amounts of money at their flying and actually the, the the result is favoring the chap that actually does his preparation properly and saves his money so it's very important to prepare yourself mentally with walkthroughs with video analysis writing i remember um something that's always stuck with me i flew the world championships and i watched a guy do the maths to each figure that he was flying and as it happens you know he was podium most uh, on most programs um and that was very interesting to see i kind of laughed at it there i thought oh, you know, it's a bit of a strange thing to do but you know i was definitely the he was definitely having the last laugh so you know he, that's maybe a bit um 
uh, a bit far for people that aren't looking to compete. But the importance of pre-fight preparation with your walkthroughs, your video analysis. Um, we're going to talk about the I'm safe model in, in a minute um, to how to define whether you, you know you should be going flying. But the importance of pre-fight preparation. Don't don't ever underestimate how important it is again it goes back to the you know falling into the hands of people that think aerobatics is unsafe i always make it my mission now um i think you know when i was a bit younger i probably got very annoyed with that and would like to go back at them but now i make it a mission to be able to show them that we're safe through embarrassing them by how safe we are so i'll always talk to the duty instructor i'll talk to the members i'll talk to every single person i think needs to know what i'm doing on the airfield in the power world again i'll talk to everyone in the in the area i'll put a radio call out make sure everyone is aware of what i'm going to do make sure the airplane is fully prepared make sure my students got complete video analysis complete walkthroughs and we're both in the right mental model the crew resource cockpit resource management is all there and you'll find that if you prepare yourself in that sort of to that extremity you'll find that the flying is kind of something you you know you can relax about because all you've got to now think about is the figures and the flying obviously the the tm aspects that go with flying as a whole but um you'll find your your the enjoyment of aerobatics the enjoyment of this flight in in, in question will be a lot more enjoyable with pre-flight preparation definitely definitely can't emphasize that enough um understanding of angle of attack it's very interesting i am um, I, I try and attend a lot of these Gasco seminars that go, and I'm going to talk about Gasco in a bit and the importance of it. But um, understanding the angle of attack was a, a very interesting one for me. Um, something that's kind of seems very obvious. Um, but the more I think about it, the more times I've, or more situations I've been in where I've been instructing aerobatics, I've been doing flight tests for people for, for whatever it is. Um, you know, I teach in the simulator at work. And there have been points where i've thought actually there's a, understanding angle of attack is something we don't all do well enough um when i get in an airplane now and, and I, I must say i didn't uh, in the past i will always explore the extremities of the flight envelope you know when does it high speed stall when does it buff it uh, have i got a shorter wing have i got a longer wing it's more pertinent for the power flying and powered aerobatics i like but exploring your aircraft's angle of attack um exploring you know where it starts to stall high speed stall um what points the critical angle going into the book and actually really understanding the angle of attack can really help you um i personally i i fly and display a, a cassette racer and it really brought it home to me i was flying uh, into an airfield ooh, probably middle of the summer last year having done a lot of instructing in some fairly docile airplanes um and I was nice and high. I'd not flown it for a long time. I played very, very safe flying into Damon's Hall. And as I turned on to final, I had about nine, you know, 85 knots on the clock. I usually turn at about 90. I pulled very, very slightly into the turn and it completely bit me and, and flick rolled. Um, and that brings it home to me. The, the under, it brought it home to me is the, the, the lack of understanding of that particular airplane's angle of attack. So it's very important to go if you've flown something else going into something different that maybe is a bit more sporty uh, i mean the cassette's only got 15 foot wingspan so it's you know it's very different and again as i say it's probably more pertinent to, to the power powered airplanes but it brought it home to me the importance of understanding angle of attack and uh, and also the the chap you know very experienced chap flown all sorts of airplanes in the gasco seminar uh, mentioned it too so if you're gonna fly a new airplane fly a new sequence of aerobatics make sure you've got a firm understanding of that aircraft's angle of attack you've read the flight manual um and if you're flying something you know you're coming out of a in the gliding world you're coming out of a k21 you're going to fly swift or a fox make sure you have the briefings go up and do a familiarization flight and just explore the flight envelope maybe not even doing any aerobatics just some positive pulls negative pushes whatever you want to do noise and environmental considerations um yeah there is a lot of this certainly some for gliding but more for for the power guys among us tonight um if you're in an aerobatic box aerobatics you know fine it's probably no time if it's a competition however just be very aware of you know all you glider guys that fly cross country will all be too aware of the nice expensive racehorse in the field that you go and scare and have to pay a lot of money for um and the same thing goes with aerobatics it's quite noisy especially when an engine's revving at high rpm um just be a bit careful what you're doing when, I, when i'm going to a new gliding site i'll always have a walk around it 
Um, I remember some members when uh, at our club, was myself and at the time, my deputy CFI, walking around the airfield, looking off the edge of a cliff. And they were wondering what we were doing, whether, you know, we wanted to jump off because we, we'd regretted taking these guys to a hillside. But every time I go somewhere new, whether it be power site, gliding site, I'll always have a walk around the airfield in the evening, you know, go to the bar, talk to people, be very sociable. But then I'll, I'll make a point to go and have a walk around just to see, you know, options around me. Um, if you're in a an aerobatic glider, aerobatic SEP, it's very important to understand what's over the boundary of the airfield. If you're in an aeroplane that's quite responsive, maybe quite unstable, it's quite good to see exactly where you can put it and what the options are. Uh, should you have a rope back slash engine failure on on you know shortly after takeoff, and again, it's nothing comes close to them and having a walk and just going around the airfield, seeing what you seeing what you think's around. Um, again, if you're going to fly any aerobatics, if you you know in the power, if you're going to fly aerobatics somewhere that's new to you, um, maybe go and talk to whoever it is below as a courtesy call just to say to clear it with them. Again, it's all about public image. Why do you think we're not flying at the moment? Um, it's what the public perceive largely so you know it, it does does you well to go and clear it with people below spatial disorientation now, again that's a point that i put in there because that's quite a big thing um it affects quite a lot of people and it's not just a case of losing where you are at that point in time i don't know you you're going into a, a tail slide or a pull humpty it's not just a case of losing your spatial you know spatial awareness getting disorientated releasing the g and knowing exactly where you are it's something that frightens quite a lot of people it'd be consciously subconsciously for me yeah it happens quite a lot for me when i'm pulling hard most people you know if you haven't done any aerobatics before three and a half g to four g you can expect to have some you know some issue with load factor if you like um <clears throat> but spatial disorientation is, is an interesting one because it affects me sometimes subconsciously. I get disorientated. I don't know where I am. Uh, and then I find, you know, I've maybe left, I don't know, my hand on the air brakes, which is a bit of a cardinal sin for, for gliders, or maybe in the powered airplane, I've not adjusted the power as much as I should have done. And I find my TEM starting to break down. Um, so when you're finding yourself in a state of spatial disorientation, just stop exactly what you're doing, release the G, have a little look round, aviate, navigate, communicate, and understand that actually just getting disorientated isn't the only bit of it. Other things will start to break down as well in your TEM cycle. So it's very important to stop what you're doing, have a look round, gather your thoughts, understand what's happening to you, make sure you're flying the aeroplane properly, you're navigating properly, and you're talking properly. And you'll find that actually, in the early stage of my career, I probably didn't do that very well. I remember going and flying in Poland and, you know, pulling G and going, oh, where am I? Oh, I know where I am and cracking on. And not a very safe thing to do, really. Stop, think about who you are, aviate, navigate, communicate, fly the airplane properly. And you'll probably find that the height you've lost in a glider thinking about this thing and the height you would have lost maybe just trying to crack on um, is probably, I don't know, 100 feet, 50 feet, very negligible amount. So it's much better you spend that 100 feet you know, making sure you and the aircraft are safe. So it's a big one. That spatial disorientation is a, it's a very big one. Uh, and that leads quite nicely onto the effects of positive and negative G. Um, affects, div contrary to popular belief, it affects people very differently. I've got friends uh, in the power world that, you know, can't hear anything but can see perfectly well when they pull a, a hefty amount of G. For me personally is my um, vision tends to go, but my kind of, my sense and my feel and my hearing seems to stay uh, and the same happens with negative g it's a bit different for different people so don't be worried if you go up and you you pull your 4g um you know you, you've pulled your 4g in a in a program and you feel like you're a bit disorientated and oh and i felt this don't worry about it it affects different people in very different ways um but again it goes on to the um spatial disorientation thing you know treat it as a as a problem stop sort it out and then carry on the flight envelope is something that I would have talked about tonight, but it takes quite a long time to do properly. Um, it's really important to understand that for any bit of aerobatics there. A lot of people don't teach it at beginner's level. I quite like to bring it in there. You're giving someone a rating for, um, you know, an EASA standard, well, now non-EASA standard rating. It's going on an SFCR license. It's kind of a ticket into the big wide world of aerobatics. 
And it's important not only to understand where you're operating the aircraft normally, but remember we're teaching you to get it wrong as well. And sometimes it can take going to the end of that flight envelope to get it back. Hopefully not, but it's important you understand how it works. So I'd encourage all coaches out there to try and teach their students the flight envelope very early on. Uh, ASI colour coding. Um, yeah, again, I'm not going to go into the colour coding today. Um, that's something that can be looked at later on. However, one big issue I've had with colour coding is I've been to a few clubs, got in the aeroplane and having read the flight manual again, you know, me thinking I'm being silly and not remembering a K21's uh, V speeds, um, realised that the colour coding on the ASIs have been completely incorrect. Um, so it's very, very important to cross check the flight manual with the colour coding on your ASIs, making sure the front and the rear are talking to each other correctly. Um, in this situation, actually, again, completely my fault. I was taking a student up very early on in my uh, gliding instructor days and he was pulling way past, well, putting um, full control movement in way past my uh va and i was looking at it going that's, that's strange and i knew what it was but again human factors you're in the air you're in the heat at the moment i'm trying to teach him you completely forget it and i came down looked at it and and mine was about 20 to 25 knots out from what the guy in the front was reading so again just check that front and rear are reading the same and talking to each other your daily inspection for for gliding is very important um it is important for any time you're flying um uh, really what i'm saying with this is that the kind of individual points you can look for that are maybe more pertinent to signs of wear with aerobatic gliders. Um, if you've got uh, sort of cord-wise hairline cracks, again, get your instructor to have a look at it, get your inspector to have a look at it, likely to be gel cracks. Uh, Span-wise cracks along the spar are, are very, very, very strong giveaways of, um, of stress. So if you're doing a DI and, and you see anything like that, on an aerobatic glider, you know, maybe it has been abused or has been used quite a lot. Um, that is a big sign of stress. On a K21, specifically your tailplane, again, as a T-tail aeroplane, you should have some movement if you move it towards the, the tip of the tail. Um, when you go more into the root end and you move it, you're just looking for minimal to no play at all. Uh, and again, I've flown a few K21s with quite a lot of play there that have been found to have issues. So very important. Um, your batteries, your DI books, your... Uh, you know, we all have these in our wing routes, but please make sure they're taken out. Um, if you've really got the time, try and take a seat pan out. Um, I found all sorts in a seat pans of gliders, wedding rings, harmonicas, you name it. Um, otherwise hidden to you when you're having a good look round. So really important to have a look at that. Spin characteristics are another big one. Um, brought it home to me flying, uh, what was it? A PW6 actually. Um, the standard spin recovery, again, is designed to work for, for anything. However, it's a good idea to have a look in your flight manual because you may find the spin characteristics and the spin recovery technique changes very slightly from glider to glider. Um, you go and read a PW6 manual. It's different to that of a K13 manual and different to that of a K21 flight manual. Um, so quite important to go and look at the spin characteristics of the aircraft again found in the flight manual and more so the spin recovery technique again the standard spin recovery should work but again you know professional test pilot with a brand new airplane with all those hours has probably deemed this spin characteristic or this spin recovery to be better and written in the flight manual so it would you know do you well to go and look at that um unusual attitudes and the recovery i'm going to use this point to show you um a quick video i love human factors in in aviation that's what i really enjoy doing and, and through instructing in the simulator at work it's quite interesting because you can see how very good pilots get broken down by human elements um i often find people knocking the air france incident that happened when they stalled from god knows how high into the water but until you've been in that situation and seen how um human factors plays a part in it how the airplane's screaming at you how things go wrong it's very difficult to pass judgment um and the same goes for aerobatics and unusual attitude recovery under that sort of stressful workload i've taught so many people that you know wanting to learn to roll or do anything like that, and i stick them in that 45 degree inverted dive building up the speed and i say you know what you're going to do and there's panic they just don't know what to do and you know inherently they try and pull um which as you know many of you will know is is a cardinal sin but it's very, very important to 
get your coach, get your instructor to put you in many unusual attitude situations and train yourself the right recovery technique. I assure you when you're inverted at 45 degrees, building up some speed, the noise is increasing, the stress is increasing, maybe your voices are getting louder. Everything in your being does not want to do the unnatural thing, you know, fight or flight. You do not want to push hard to reduce the speed. Um, so it's very, very important to go with a coach, train yourself for these situations and train yourself the correct recovery technique. Maybe read about it, however it you know sort of fits your learning model. Make sure you look at it. Uh, I'm going to show you an example now. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the sound on it, but uh, there's no sort of aerobatic incidents that I can find, but I always use as part of a training module uh, an aerotope um, that is used in the UK. Um, if you're in this seminar, thank you very much for putting it on because it's very honest and very useful for people to learn from. Um, the air brakes come open shortly after his takeoff. Um, and rather than sitting on his hands, having a think about what's happening, what the aircraft is presenting to him, it kind of goes into a bit of a panic. And the time that's spent panicking is time that is just going to the scene of the crash. And the same kind of thing applies to unusual attitude recovery. When you're in an unnatural situation or the aircraft's telling you something that's making you panic, you know, fight or flight, you can spend a lot of time panicking when actually spending three or four seconds putting your hands on your bum and thinking about the situation, thinking about what the aircraft's presenting to you um, can cause a separate outcome. So I'm just going to try now uh, and get it here on Safari. I must apologise if, if you hear the, the guy, he does make a few expletives, so if you're sensitive to swear words, probably yeah, turn it away. You may not be able to hear it. Yeah, we haven't got any sound, Alex, so don't worry. <laughs> So just to pause, the tug pilot just come off the ground now and instructors, pilots in there, that's a very long ground run for the aircraft he's in. I think you know, all those chats. A very long ground run and he's been given, and, and I'm mean, sure you could probably see the air sight that the point the air breaks open, he's been given this golden opportunity now either to think about what's happened, maybe release or continue. But the human model brings us into this focusing on the problem and potentially not thinking about what's happening. Excellent. So I'm kind of hoping you guys all um, all witnessed that. Again, I probably should have uh, mentioned that there might have been a, a bit of a prang at the end of it, but it was quite important to see. He had about, you know, easily a minute there from when the air breaks open to continuing to have a think about what happened. And I'm sure instructors have all been in that situation. It brings a, brings a point to aerobatic flying as well. You know, when you're in that situation, which is slightly unusual to you, that's slightly out of your comfort zone um something that perhaps you know if you're thinking very honestly with yourself you weren't expecting you shouldn't be with aerobatics anyway um it's very important to use those few minutes sitting on your hands thinking about what's happened and executing a safe recovery plan um i like to think that you know i've flown with a few guys now um in gliders and one of them was really really good at it i put him in an unusual attitude and i wish i'd videoed it because it was a complete textbook moment the speed was increasing inverted 
I knew exactly what we were going to do. We were going to have to push. And he wasn't. He wasn't sure at all of what was going to happen. But used that time to fight every bodily stress, put you know his hands down and think about it, and came up with a, a, a safe safe method of correcting the problem. So even if you're slightly unsure, just take the time to think about it. Um, emergency bailout procedure, kind of similar to what I've just mentioned with the unusual attitudes and the recovery. When you're under that sort of stress, it's very easy maybe on the ground to think you know how to get out. Um, the very nature of an emergency and a potential bailout means it's fairly, fairly serious and the aircraft's likely to not be flying properly anyway. Um, the sort of stresses that are on yourself there, I think, are probably more than most of us can understand. So it's so, so important. You know, if I'm flying a new aircraft, uh, in fact, powered aerobatics, I'm, I'm flying with a parachute, um, sit in the aircraft and I spend about five minutes just closing my eyes and touching every bit in order as to how I'm going to get out. So I know that, you know, if we are under that sort of workload or we are under that sort of load factor and, you know, I may be start to have my effects of g-force i know that i can do the touch drill to get out and we, even if we're not it's very important when you've got that workload to know exactly the bailout procedure um, and what i would say um well, this is make sure the canopy jettison in your clubs works i've been to so many gliding clubs where i've pulled I've, I've just had a little nudge or they've pulled the canopy off and it's been completely sea solid and it's rusted all the way down so make sure the emergency uh, jettison works and you know that you're going to get out because there's been a few places that i've been now that if you pulled that lever you, you just wouldn't have got the canopy off um tm and lookout so threat and error management and lookout again um if you're in a competition we hope that the box has been no time we hope that people are watching for for their airplanes coming through um but again you're under sort of going flying you, it's very easy when you you're flying aerobatics to get into that habit of uh, getting into your sequence, maybe flying your sequence really well and forgetting the other problems that come with just general flying, you know, launch failures, um, uh, circuit planning, uh, low in circuit, all these things that we teach and all these things that you guys will learn um, can sometimes go out the window. So it's very important still to think about your threat and error management. Think about your lookout. So, you know, if you're training, um, it's quite a big risk to take in a normal training environment to just go all out on the sequence again if it's really well briefed all the other glider pilots all the other pilots in your area know what you're doing go and fly a sequence as long as it's been briefed that that's the place you're going to do it um if not do a couple of figures pause have a look out a couple of phys figures pause have a look out uh, and it's very important to do that um i know i've been in numerous situations now with the you know with the uh, other aircraft and you know i'm sure honestly I, everyone else has i've been instructing many times and and found airplanes that i didn't really know were there uh, and instructors um no lying there have been times where the students point something out and i go oh yeah i didn't know that was there um so and that's in normal normal time so god knows what we miss when we're doing arrows in an unbriefed place um not that you should be anyway um tm cards are also a good idea um if people want those at the end uh, when i was cfi i wrote some tm cards for all the instructors and all the pilots we have a big gap um with gliding as a whole and uh, and and especially aerobatics with tm and and how we manage that and i came to the assumption that I'd, I'd written these cards out with every um problem that's not covered on an eventualities brief we do our cb sift bec and we cover the eventualities but you know what's going to what's going to affect the safe outcome of an eventuality, what's going to affect the safe outcome of an aerobatic flight. So I'd encourage all you guys, if you're flying aerobatics, if you're flying normally, and again, I'm quite happy to publish my template, write all the things, you know, threats, exterior threats that are going to kill you. You know, that's the environment. Error, how are you going to match those threats to cause the crash? So how are you personally is the error, how you're going to have a problem and how the environment's going to happen. So you've got threat, error management. How are those going to combine to give you an accident? So how can you manage the wind shear on the approach? How can you manage the wind that's blowing over the poplar trees on your right-hand side that's on, you know, blowing towards your approach direction? Um, how can you manage all the other traffic in the circuit? How can, you know, is the glider current, am I current? It's really important to go through those cards because then it kind of sinks in with the eventualities. You know, what am I going to do today to stop myself dying? And then how can I do that and incorporate that into the eventualities brief? So TM cards, I find are very useful. Uh, I think uh, 
the Essex Gliding Club hopefully found that very useful. Uh, and it kind of combines, you know, the exterior threats and your threats as a human um, into a safer outcome, maybe with your eventualities, or especially with aerobatics, with sort of the, the, the general nature of what you're doing. So into the slightly more fun stuff. So hopefully the, um, the the sort of pertinent points, the theory weren't too dull. I didn't want to go too far into the theory, as I said. So what we're going to look at is kind of a standard badge. Again, I've not done a standard badge racing for quite a while. So I'm sure there's other instructors here that can fill the guys in if I've missed anything out. But as far as I'm aware, this is what it was. It certainly is the last time I did it, um, which wasn't too long ago, is a 45 degree downline. And what you're looking at now is uh, an Arresti chart, it's an Arresti sequence plate. So this first figure that you've got here, uh, you see the circle just above, just below, sorry, the number one. This first figure is a 45 degree downline. And the figure finishes with a little uh, line at the end of the of, of the figure into the number two which is a loop as i'm sure you can all work out number three is a chandelle number four is a pull humpty bump so you pull to the vertical up line nip it over the top i'll talk to you about a nip in a minute hold the vertical down line pull to level a 180 degree turn and then a 45 degree climbing line and that constitutes your uh, basic badge now I'm going to say in a minute um, at, uh, at the end of this, I've got lots of crib cards that I wrote out for every figure really up to advance. Um, so the things you're going to look for, and I've got notes on every figure. And if you want those, feel free to get in touch with me because as you know, what the common errors are, we're going to talk about in a minute, you know, each figure sort of judging the glider being a K21, what entry speed, what sort of common errors do you have? Uh, and I've got all those written out. I'm not going to put those on the slide because it would have taken up so much time. And um, but we'll have a, a a brief look at the common errors a bit later on but that is your standard badge uh, and what you're going to have to do to to complete it so talking about the pre-flight preparation with aerobatics i always use the i'm safe module so illness medication stress alcohol fatigue and eating so have you know had any illnesses in the past in the past day if you had a cold you had a migraine whatever medication are you on any meds that are going to affect the performance of your flight stress Anyone at home stressing you out? Um, I've got a five-month-old puppy downstairs. It certainly wouldn't be doing any advanced errors at the moment. Alcohol. Um, you know, have you been drinking? Um, fatigue and eating. You know, have you? It's important also to understand the difference between tiredness and fatigue. And fatigue is a bit more longer onset. Uh, and eating. And make sure you have eaten before you go and do any aerobatics. Um, so do the I'm safe module, have a good think about it yourself. Am I safe to go and fly? Literally, I'm safe. And then do a sequence walkthrough. Uh, I don't know if you uh, guys have ever been to, to into any aerobatic or been to a club that's you've seen people sort of walking around slightly strangely, throwing their hands in the air, looking like they're having a fight. Um, but they're probably doing a sequence walkthrough. And I, it's a difficult one to, to explain. You get a lot of people... Um, kind of looking at that, wondering what you're doing. Maybe they think you're showing off, whatever. Uh, you know, if you're seeing this and other people doing it, let them do it. I promise you it's so important towards a safe safe flight and safe and, and actually their sort of value for money out of their aerotow. Uh, and a sequence walkthrough is complete, completely, completely vital. Um, believe it or not, you can work out positioning very well with where the wind's coming from, harmony very well. Um, sequence walkthroughs are vital. So if you see anyone doing it, just leave them alone. Um, I know in the past when I'm doing it, um, uh, you know, power gliding, whatever, you get a lot of people going, especially going up to a display last year. I remember one display was doing a walkthrough and people were just coming up and saying, oh, what are you doing? And I'm going, oh, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to get this right, not talk to you. Um, so, you know, be be quite strict with it. If you're doing a walkthrough, you're doing it to get your program right and not talk. So, um, you know, leave people alone if you see them doing that. And if you're keen on asking them about it, maybe ask them afterwards. Um, video analysis from a previous flight. So I am uh, I actually have a 40 pound, I'll see if I can find it and show it to you. It's called a QMOX camera. Um, it's about 40 quid, does equally as good as a GoPro, I think. Uh, I'm not a professional film person, but um, I stick that in the cockpit facing forward. So facing the instrument panel. Um, if I'm in a powered airplane side by side, I'd probably put it on the student side, looking down the right hand seat. Uh, sorry, the left-hand seat, um, and uh, just analyze flights. Again, I was saying about the, the chap that looks at the maths of it, I got into the habit of looking at um, videos, 
uh, I did it more uh, when I was flying at advanced, but I was looking through videos, looking through previous flights, looking for programs, and I'd find that actually maybe two or three training flights were worth, you know, one video flight. And I'm saving myself all this money just analyzing a video, looking at where I got it wrong, looking at where I got it right, sitting down with a coach. If you've got a club coach or uh, an instructor there that can talk you through the program, video analysis is completely essential. Um, we don't really want any of this facing you, as pretty as we all think we are doesn't really show you anything unless you want to make a, a cool video out of it. You're not really going to get much of uh, much um, informative stuff out of it. So look forward, keep the camera forward and get some videos of the fly. If you can get one facing out on the wing, that's quite a good one to see because it gets you a, a sort of viewpoint on the angles. Um, Pre-flight preparation with passengers. I did a, um, I've got a seminar prepared actually that uh, I did once uh, to the Essex Club um, on mutual flying and actually how potentially risky it can be in my opinion it's mutual flying has actually got more risk to it than basic instruction um because you're flying with people you inherently know and that problem then leads to sort of not wanting to disappoint the person that you know you're flying with not leading you know, you've got peer pressure um all this sort of stuff going on so if you're flying with a passenger um I'd recommend against it if you're doing a training flight, don't fly with a passenger unless it's a coach. Um, however, if you are going to take a passenger up for an aerobatic flight, treat it as a, you know, don't treat it as a as a bit of fun. Treat it as every other flight that you would do. You know, maybe have a walkthrough and make certain the passenger is completely briefed. I used to do um, uh, aerobatic experience flights when I was a course instructor. I used to work as a course instructor. And, um, yeah, again, it lots of lessons learned in life you know i flew with these guys and i had my advanced ticket and i went to the cfi and said oh this is great off we go and i took off and i used to just absolutely you know hound these guys we do rolling we do pushing and you know maybe 50 percent of them would like it um but the others would have liked it i found that maybe 20 percent of the people that i flew with didn't like it but probably would if i'd spoken to them a bit more um so prior preparation and all that, you know, sit that, sit your passengers down, talk to them exactly what is going to happen in the flight, anything you're not happy with, and talk to them as you go. Um, and CFIs and instructors, um, I would personally advise that you set a reasonably high um, minimum hours time before this happens, before anyone does take passengers. I think it's important that you do. I don't think people come to aerobatics unless they experience that in the first place. So I think passenger flying in aerobatics is quite important. But you know, make sure you get the right people and make sure, that, you know, the people that you're flying not only you know, got the uh, maturity to do it if they're younger, but make sure or even older in some cases, but make sure, you know, that they cover all the basis, the theoretical stuff, the niceties to asking if passengers is all right, briefing them very well beforehand. Um, pressure. Uh, yeah, you see this quite a lot. Are you under any pressure? Uh, not so much with powered aerobatics. You've got an engine to get yourself to the hold um however with glider aerobatics you've often got a queue waiting for your glider to be pulled onto line um there's a bit of subconscious pressure conscious pressure whatever it is um but it's quite easy to fall into that trap um of preparing your program and stopping because you're watching your glider get a bit further and you know that perceived pressure starts to seep into the way you fly and the way you handle your 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 sort of safety TM aspects of it. So make sure that you alleviate as much pressure as possible. Maybe pull your glider offline and say it's going on here or, you know, put it online when it's ready to go. Wait for a lull in the grid and maybe go and fit in with the other guys. Make sure, you know, you're going when it's a fairly stress-free environment. And spectators are another one. If you've got your mum, your dad, your family, everyone there watching you, um, it, it can be an issue, you know, you can have, uh, have big problems with that. So if you've got spectators um, and you don't want them there, you know, it's your life, ask them to maybe, I don't know, go for a cup of tea, you know, be, it's it's your flight. So make sure you have it the way you want it. If you've got them there, it's something to just have on the back of your mind. Um, normal threat and management is often forgetting, uh, forgotten when focusing on an aerobatic flight. So normal TEM in inverted commas, I put as being kind of, the threat and management you do as though you were doing a wish launch flight to fly a circuit. Remember, you know, what comes up comes down. You're only flying aerobatics, you know, as a buffer to the flight. So make sure your, you know, aerato launch failures, make sure you're low in circuit, make sure, you know, ev everything you think about when you're flying normally is executed 
before you take off for an aerobatic flight. When you're focusing on the sequence, you've done all these walkthroughs, you, you're talking to the judges, if you've got them, you're talking to your coach. Sometimes very easy to forget that TEM for, for normal flights. So it brings it back, you know, have some discipline, set yourself a, a very defined hard deck as to which aerobatic stop safe flying begins. It's quite difficult to do. You've done an aerobatic program um, and you're all in high dough, you know, oh, it's really good. That was fantastic. That was really, really brilliant. I'm about to show you another video of the world championship flight after we've had a look at some common errors. Um, and it's very, you know, it's very easy to get yourself really hyped up. You know, you see in this video, he's really happy. He's, he's won a program. He knows he's won a program. He's really, really delighted. Um, and then stops. It kind of goes into a bit more of a safe circuit mode. So make sure you have that defined cutoff and that discipline to your flight. Um, club members, they're terrible, right? They're really, really bad for heckling and distracting and offering life experience that they had 50 years ago in doing a loop with somebody. Listen to a club coach, aerobatic FI, um, or anyone that's rated to teach you or advise you as to what to do. Um, try not to listen to the club members that think they're experts. Um, no offense, but it, it is rife. So listen to a coach, listen to an aerobatic FI, listen to your instructors, listen to the CFI, listen to everyone in a position to advise you aerobatic or just general flying. Um, try and avoid the club members, maybe more on the younger people that maybe slightly more influence. Um, but sort of try and listen to the people that, you know, you need to listen from. Um, today is not the day. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a video from Brian Spreckley at the Selprain Grand Prix, probably a couple of years ago now. Um, I always say that now. It's a brilliant, brilliant video, that absolutely fantastic video. You know, we've lost so many pilots in in flying, in aerobatics, in, in racing, in power flying, in airline accidents. And, you know, a large majority of them come down to us getting it completely wrong you know the air, as brian says the aircraft don't fall apart they don't just demolish they're very strong and it's very important that we make sure that today is not the day that we don't cock up to an extent that actually it makes us see the steaming hole uh, and i say that to myself before when i've done all the threats all the management i've briefed my student brief who i'm flying with i just say today's not the day. i'm not going to die in my airplane today and i'm going to make certain that you know everything i do on this flight is going to be safe um, and the importance of communication to the DI and proper understanding of the circuit. Again, it kind of comes into the above. Um, and the importance of communication within the cockpit as well is very important. Um, the it, It's very important to have that when you're in that stressful environment, when you're inverted, when you're doing a loop, when you're doing a pull humpty bump, to kind of be able to have that effective communication. When we raise our voice, you can see your student's effective level go right the way down. And you kind of have to do it with aerobatics because the wind noise is quite strong. <clears throat> but if you're trying to get something across, if you're an instructor, try and make it as calm as you possibly can. I know it sounds very silly, but when you start to raise your voice, whether it's the wind noise or whatever, you just completely lose your student. You'll lose them forever. You won't get them back. So try your very best to keep a calm manner. When I'm doing um, spinning, aerobatics now i've actually devised a headset device so i can wear a, a headset with an amplifier again all secure and uh, and very personal to me but um it, it enables me to kind of communicate to the student and amplify my voice without sounding like i'm i'm stressed and actually having used it a bit with aerobatics and spinning it's it's very useful you find that you know one if you're flying with members that are a bit hard of hearing or if you're flying with people that you know just get quite easily stressed you know we all know, you know, the instructors among us, there are members that get stressed that maybe you don't know about on the ground. So it's quite important and it, it does relax them when you're flying with that. So, you know, again, if anyone, any instructors, anyone in here wants to see what I've devised, feel free to contact me. So the flying, um, again, this is a general sort of assumption as to what you're going to do. Flight one is usually a demonstration of all the figures involved with the rating. So if I'm doing a standard badge for someone, I'll fly the diving line, I'll fly the loop, fly the pull Humpty bump, fly the chandelle. I'll talk them through every every element of the figure. So what I'm teaching them, you know, where to look in the lines, where to look in the when you're going upside down. Uh, I teach, you know, how to keep positioned wherever you are, to keep positioning to whoever you're displaying to. Um, so, but flight one is always usually a demonstration of all the figures involved and a talk through. Flight two typically will be a student attempt at the figures. 
flight three will either be a subsequent practice or further uh, will either be a sequence practice or further figure practice so depending on how they've grasped the figures we can either start trying to link them very slowly again building blocks is everything i'll probably start with i don't know three lim linking figures so they just fly three three figures maybe use the rest as figure practice completely depends on how they're getting on um, and flight four will be sequence practice or a solo test flight again that's something that you know i have done very rarely um with people but usually as i say now the you know it, it tends to take a lot more than that so the flight will only be judged on safety and not the standard of the figures the above is an example of, is an example profile which likely require more training so it's kind of just a, a likely profile of what you're going to do to to do the standard badge and again depends on what sort of aerato heights you get or how high you get away if you've taken the wire launch so common mistakes at all levels so if you've got that sequence in front of you um if you've taken a picture or whatever um pausing between figures is a big one um again with i kind of encourage it i know there's people in there that you know we, we teach that don't want to do competition aerobatics um but i kind of i try and encourage the precision to the aerobatics whether you're going to do competitions or not and pausing between them is only making it precise but also getting your sort of general composure back when i'm you know flying for practice displays flying in competition i kind of view the sort of club aerobatics and the competition aerobatics as a, a fairly similar stuff and when you're going into display aerobatics yeah they are a bit more flowing and a bit different but certainly for teaching a pause between figures do the figure stop where am i what have i done i'm aviating navigating communicating right next figure get your composure back so pausing between figures is a big mistake Harmony and positioning. Again, if you're a competition aerobatic person, if you're going into a beginner's comp, um, I would probably say even 70% of the competition is one on where they are positioned in the box. Um, in UK competitions, we're not so good at box markers. Uh, as I found out going to my first international, is you look down and you think actually a one kilometer square box from 4,000 feet is pretty tiny. Uh, and to position into that is is fairly impressive. And, and you do get a lot of positioning and harmony points. So... Uh, even if you're flying for fun, it's quite nice to be able to plan the flight so it starts and finishes in a similar location, maybe just a bit lower. So have a think about that on a walkthrough. So when you're walking through that standard program, think about where you are um, and think about you know how flowing the sequence is, how many pauses you have. Creeping lines for the competition, guys. Um, again, I'm showing you all these things. Uh, you're going to see a video in a moment of a, a, a world championship flight. Again, it's at unlimited level. However, you see all these things not, not being done. Creeping lines. If you're going for an angle, a 45 degree diving line, for instance, you look at the head, you look at whatever's in front of you. And in some videos, maybe you've taken them of your aerobatics, you'll start to see the nose slowly creep up. That's a creep line. So if you're going for a 45 degree line, Pin something on the nose and keep it there and don't let it lift until you're going into the next figure. Um, the other thing you'll find, you can't quite see it in this video. I was trying to look for another one, but it's head position during your figures. That's really, really important. Uh, again, it comes back to the threats as well, getting suckered into the cockpit rather than having your head out. One, moving your head around in the right place is going to make your aerobatics a bit better. You're going to have more um, orientation as to where you are. Um, and your airmanship and your TM is going to be a lot more enhanced. So head position during the figures is both good for your aerobatics and for the sort of TM sides you're flying. Um, when you're in a downline, head position needs to be looking at the wingtip. So any angle, any angle you're going for, you need to look at the wingtip. And when you're looking to fly then on that angle, keep your head straight. So wingtips for angles, when you've got the angle, look straight ahead. And the reason you get the angle and look straight ahead is because you're trying to iron out that creeping line. <clears throat> Again, that can be for both competition and display, whatever you're doing. Rolling on a heading is another big one that people, you know, sometimes get a bit mistaken. Um, you're not turning the aircraft, so if you're pitching out. And a shundel for me, right, is one you have to turn on a heading. Teaching a shundel is very difficult, and flying a shundel right is probably one of the hardest figures in the in the in the uh, Arresti catalog. Um, you pull up onto a 45 degree climbing line and a roll on a heading is not turning the aircraft. You're pinning the nose on a whatever feature you've got, a cloud, whatever you can find, and rolling the aircraft without turning. What you'll probably then find is when you're on that angle and you've rolled without turning, the nose will want to drop. 
common mistakes with the chandelle is they go on to their 45 degree, they look ahead, they start to roll, and then start to pull around the chandelle without letting the nose drop. And what happens then is the nose just gets higher and higher and higher and kind of flops 180 degrees behind you. So what you're looking for is a 45 degree climbing line, a roll to about, I don't know, 45, 60 degrees on a heading, wait for the nose to drop, move your head round 180 degrees, pull the aircraft round so then you can fly the aeroplane around the corner, roll off on a 45 degree down line and pause in that direction. A lot of people then pull straight out the figure. Pause and then pull to level and get your composure. You've just changed direction on a on a chandelle, so it's a good idea to stop, look at where you're going um, and think about what's happening. And it is quite a complex figure. Uh, rudder and stick position when aileron rolling. Yeah. That's a big one. If you're learning to roll, um, a full roll, that is, um, a lot of people get a bit confused with what your hands and feet are doing. Um, I am a big advocate, actually. Uh, I've got a few um, students lined up to come and do their uh, some flying in a Cap 10 and, and extras next year. And, and actually, my main thing for them, having been glider pilots, is we're going to go into a K-21 and learn to roll because... Rolling a cap, rolling an extra, very simple. You just move the stick over and it does it five times a second. Um, in a K21, you've got to learn all the elements of a roll. You've got to put the stick in. You've got to move the rudder. You've got to change the rudder direction when you're upside down. Um, so rudder and stick position with it when Ada and rolling is really important. Uh, if you're going to the right, rolling to the right, is really important to keep your full in a K21, this is to full right aileron. and you often find when someone's going round the roll, coming towards inverted, they start to release that pressure off a bit. You've got to keep that right on the stop and move the top rudder. So if you're rolling to the right, you've got stick over to the right and moving the top rudder means you're moving your left foot because the nose is now, or the rudder is now acting as a bit of an elevator to keep the nose onto the horizon. You're now likely to going to have to push when you're inverted to keep the nose up. So rudder and stick position with, with alien rolling is something that takes quite a lot of coordination. But when you can master that in a K21, yeah, you're going to be completely fine in anything else you start to roll. Fox, Swift, Caps, whatever you're doing. Um, and axis positioning for those competition guys um, is another common error. People come out of a figure at completely the wrong axis. Um, if anyone witnessed my... Uh, I, I remember... I can't even remember what year it was now, but I, I don't know. I went into a... Um, caught a cloverleaf and completely cocked it up uh, to much people's amusement and came out in completely the wrong direction. Um, and that happens a lot. You know, if you're flying a figure and you're slightly off axis, there's ways of kind of trying to hide it when you're doing competition stuff. But sometimes it's a complete and utter uh, mistake. And as it is with me that day, it was. So you just have to stop, reposition yourself and go again. Um, so if you're sitting there and wondering, you know, how do I progress so powered aerobatics, I've done my standard badge. How do I progress? Well, once you've completed your aerobatic rating, a standard badge, you can add that to your SPL. So if you've got a cell plane pilot's license at the moment, um, you can add your aerobatic rating to that. If you want to convert that to power, once you've got that on your SPL, again, send it to Lizzie at the VGA. She'll be able to sort the sort the stuff out with the, VG, with the CAA there with getting that onto your SPL. Then when you've got that back, to convert that to a powered aeroplane, you see a one-hour flight in a Group A aerobatic SEP with an aerobatic FI and an ATO. So that's really important. If you have a friend that's got an RV8 in his farm strip, which is very, very aerobatic, you can't do any aerobatic instructing. You've got to link your aerobatic FI to an ATO. So one hour flight in the Group A SEP that's aerobatic at an ATO. And that's got to include three takeoffs and landings. So if you do three takeoffs and landings in that hour. Uh, and it also does state to cover the aerobatic syllabus. Um, so unless you're sort of God, um, it's probably very unlikely to do that in an hour. Uh, and I, I very much doubt anywhere will lease you a, a powered aeroplane or a cap or an extra or something, having only just done an hour. So failing the standard badge, uh, if you don't have the standard badge, that should read, um, you'll have to do the full AO per aerobatic course. And I've put there, wouldn't be a bad idea anyway. Um, we run AO per, we, we, the Power World run their aerobatic training in line with uh, AO per. So if you haven't got the aerobatic in rating or the standard badge, it's very important to just go to an ATO, do your aerobatic course. I think it's about a five hour course with 25 hours of theoretical training um, and go and do the whole thing. 
Um, wouldn't be a bad idea anyway if you've got the standard badge and your power on your SPL and you don't really have much power experience, it's quite a good idea to go and do the full course anyway. So what can you do next? Um, we can go up to sports level, go up to intermediate level or advanced, unlimited, instructor aerobatics. So if you're an instructor, um, new ASCAP, you're a silver, you want to be an instructor, go and be an aerobatic instructor. Become a BAE judge. And I haven't actually mentioned here, you can uh, become a BAEA flight evaluator, which basically approves that pilot having to, to fly at a competition at the level they're claiming uh, and compete. If you want any help at any level at all, don't hesitate to contact me. That's my email address down there. Uh, like I say, I, I will be come um, EASA, like, or non-EASA, non I have to keep myself saying this, come SFCL, which has now been extended again, I will be an FE. So um, if anyone needs any help with aerobatics, instructing whatever aerobatics is my niche but anyone needs any fe help with that flight examining that's absolutely fine please get in contact with me any aerobatics tool if your club wants a a day of learning different aerobatics learning you know what the aircraft can do in the flight envelope please do get in touch with me because i'm more than happy to help whether that be power or gliding um further essential reading that uh, i've got in here um gasco is a really really good one they do a lot of seminars so general aviation safety council uh, they do quite a lot of seminars. Um, the last one was was kind of run by Andrews Field Aviation. Um, previous to that, there's a few different guest speakers, but they cover all the sort of essential aspects of flying. They look at accidents. They look at um, uh, sort of statistics for how we've managed to to have all our accidents. Um, they have a guest speaker there usually that will talk about human factors, everything to do with that, keeping you safe over this period, over lockdown. Very, very important. Uh, the CAA Safety Sense leaflets for this one, it'd be specific to aerobatics. Um, have a good look at that. It covers both the gliding and power aerobatic points. Uh, and it's available on CAA Safety Com um, or Safety Sense leaflet. Um, the CAA also do training com leaflets seasonal. So for instructors, again, that's quite a good one to see for students. Very good one to see. Um, but it's kind of a, an update to how we, you know, how we, we're, we're training, how we seem to be having accidents. It's very, very good one to read. Uh, the Skyway Code for everyone that's sort of unsure of the rules of the air. Um, BAEA, I was asked by Will Jones, actually, very good instructor down at um, uh, Lasham. Uh, just to mention this event, I don't think there's a date set for it yet. However, it's very, very good. I've instructed it few many years ago um they're they're brilliant they're really useful if you want to get into aerobatics and understand what it is in an environment with people that actually you know uh, are keen on it as well it's a brilliant event to get into they usually offer a, a set price for a certain amount of flying there's lots of briefs lots of videos lots of like-minded people uh, and if you're keen to get into competition or you know just sort of general aerobatics a very good one to attend lots of good instructors there um, and the Hamburger Glider Aerobatics, I've got a picture of that up there. Uh, you'd be very, very, it's like rocking horse poo getting hold of a book like that nowadays, but you are, you'll be very um, pleased to know you can download it. I think it's still as a PDF online. Uh, you read that cover to cover. It's fantastic. It's a really good book to read. It gives you lots of the history of, of glider aerobatics and, and the current way of doing things. Um, so, guys, um, any questions? Hopefully that's been quite useful to you. Uh, I've tried not to talk about the sort of in-depth theoretical side of it. I've tried to keep it as interesting as possible for you and show you kind of what figures are involved in the sort of other stuff that you might not have thought about with aerobatics and try to cross-convert it to the power guys as well. Um, like I say, if you've got my email address, um, need any help, any advice, setting it up at your club, anything at all, please do get in contact with me. It's very important to, to raise the awareness of aerobatics as usual um, and enjoy the flying. So I'm just going to exit the screen share mode now. Uh, and if you've got any questions at all, please fire them at me.
Luce, you might have to uh, might have to give me a hand with this. Do I have to do the uh, question and answer box or? Yeah, if I um, or I can publish them and you can just answer them. So yeah, okay. Hopefully, uh, there we go. So, what arrows of any can you do in a K thirteen, K K six, or Astia? Um, so, uh, Nicholas, my answer to that is, um, again, refer to the flight manual. Have a look. It's your first port of call. See what it says in the flight manual. Um, personally, uh, and I'm sure there's probably a lot of aerobatic instructors that agree, you have to remember the age of a K-13, a K-8, or a K-6. a very old aeroplane. And whether it says it's aerobatic or not in the manual, uh, I used to own a K-6 years ago, uh, and it probably... I don't know what it is now, 65 years old. So it was maybe approved for a semi-aerobatic when it was brand new with a test pilot with all sorts of uh, good people in it. But I, I constantly think of the 65-year-old wing spa. So if it says it in the manual, I'd probably be a bit sympathetic to the age of the aircraft. A wooden aeroplane uh, that's not a Luniac or anything in maybe a cap is certain wooden, but any K-13s, K-8s, K-6s, I would certainly advise against um and ask dear again look in the flight manual but just be sympathetic to the age of the aircraft any pros or cons to training on standard basic aerobatic aircraft such as astir for example um yeah i mean i've done i think i've done an aerobatic rating on a twin astir if i can remember i may be wrong um again it the good thing about using a k21 um is i think it's quite important at the basic stage if you're keen to compete for instance it's quite interesting to see you know what can happen if you're inverted or the stresses on your body when you're inverted so if you're competing i think k21 if your your goal for the future is to compete get yourself in a k21 because it, it gives you a bit more of a better grounding uh, if you're keen just to get the rating yeah go for it i don't see any reason why it won't pw6 will do it uh, twin steer i'm sure will do it um if you're solo flying, yeah, again, kind of similar to Nicholas's comment, just be very aware of the age of the airplane and actually what it was designed for. Um, so if you're just keen for sort of basic jaunting aerobatics off a cross-country flight, then, you know, as long as it's safe and as long as it's within the limitations of the flight manual, do it. If you're looking for training, um, probably not. I wouldn't do it. It's not. Um, it's quite a slippery airplane. It would be more slippery when you're... When your nose to the floor um so i would advise against it if you're doing that uh can an ifp with an aerobatic badge do aerobatics with a passenger um steph yeah good question um yes you can if you've got a lysa i'm going to say yes at the uh and, and see a virtual gun to the head of to my head with loads of cfis at the moment um, but you can. The, the law says you, you can. If you've got an aerobatic rating um, and you have a license, then, yeah, you go and fly with passengers. Um, I don't know what experience you have, Steph, but if you've got, um, uh, you know, talk to your CFI, I would probably put a, quite a high experience band on that just purely because of the threats involved with aerobatics with passengers and the, the potential threats you know we know how volatile they can be when they're frightened so yes you can uh, you can do it but talk to the cfi and, and don't be surprised if they put a fairly high uh, limit on it do you have a k21 and do you fancy a weekend in dorset no don't have a k21 myself nicholas but more than happy to come for a weekend in dorset if you want some training Uh, air brake structural integrity gone wrong. Pull or deploy. I'm not sure I understand your question, uh, uh, Julian, but um, if you are in a certain position where, you know, you, you think you maybe want to slow down or reduce the energy, if you look at the sort of natural lateral lift distribution of a wing, if you open the air brakes, that will shift to the tips um, and you're going to end up uh, well, if you've done it hard enough, is to end up with the wings clapping each other. Um, so if you're ever in a position where um, <clears throat> you need to lose energy, 
there are other methods of doing it and you keep the air brakes firmly enclosed. Um, I'm pre-bronze, interested in improving basic flying skills and precision. What would you recommend and how much are we talking about? Um, so pre-bronze, interested in improving your basic flying skills. So Andy, um, in response to your question, I'd probably, I don't know what club you fly from, um, but I'd probably go and talk to your CFI, talk to um, any aerobatic instructors you have around and, and get cracking with this standard badge. Um, that'll improve your basic flying skills. <clears throat> It'll improve your threat and error management, improve the way you sort of view everybody you're flying. Go and do your basic badge, go and do your um, standard badge and, and then see how you feel and go from there. We haven't got any other questions at the moment, but someone is typing. So, so Andy, in response, sorry, I've just missed out a part of your question. How much are we talking about? Um, how long is a piece of string? If you do four, I mean, assuming you're a star student, um, you can kind of budget yourself for 4,000 foot aero toes. Um, and that would get you get you close in the ballpark. Again, I've flown with lots of um, lots of people that have maybe done it in one, but I, I have a bit of a problem with that. If you if I'm doing one aero toe and, and I've got a guy here that's absolutely aced it in one flight, I do get a tiny bit worried because I've not had the opportunity to see how they behave when it goes wrong. Um, so if you budget yourself at three or four, 4,000 foot toes, um, you should feel in yourself that you're well checked out and well safe. And it's, it's also quite a, quite a good time to do it. I've got somebody typing at the moment, Alex. Excellent. That is a bad Ah, uh, suggestions to keep the cost down with a Eurofox. <clears throat> um, uh, Eurofoxes, hmm, do I like them? Probably not. Um, as a fly, as flying a Eurofox, brilliant. Um, great aeroplane. As soon as you put a glider on the back, there's problems. Um, the uh, just before I resigned as CFI, I had a training program in place. Probably wasn't completely necessary for for us um but i had a training program in place to actually train aerato launch failures because I, I don't think we do it enough um but that is one big threat with the eurofox with most aerobatic gliders are you know inherently quite heavy um i've aerotoed a fox behind the eurofox many years ago and it, i do remember it being quite scary um it's usually right on the back hanging off the back of the drag curve uh, and not very pleasant. Uh, and, you know, with some aerobatic aeroplanes, I know they only have a belly hook. Um, I would, my my response to that would be, don't keep the cost down. I think that the risks with aerobatic towing with a light tug, if you've got the choice, are too high just to keep the, just to keep the cost down. If you're, you're in a position where you've got to, then you've got no choice, you know, go and get one. But uh, my strong recommendation is, is your club can afford it. Go and get yourself a bigger, more powerful tug because there's problems. Anywhere a light tug goes and a heavy aeroplane or even a light one at that, there's problems. Nicholas Barnes, do you know if any clubs have a fox for club use? Um, I know of a fox that's around. It's not for club use as such. It's used for training i mean i've been away from it for quite a long time but they do have um a fox or club use in fact i'm may come back and have a, a, a and see see about that so um i would say get in touch with your cfi or your instructors uh, they should know i don't want to mention the fox on here just in case the owners are here uh, but there is a fox for you so if you're keen on aerobatics talk to your cfi talk to your instructors uh, they'll get in touch or you can get in touch with the VJ or put you in, in, in contact with, with the owners. If the owners are in this chat, um, Nicholas, um, please feel free to, uh, you know, if, if there's someone here that pipes up, I will um, contact them, but I wouldn't like to pass judgment on their behalf. K 
Can you use simulators to practice with Peter Hibbard? Hmm, that's quite a sensible question for you. Um, yes, uh, you can use them. I did um, uh, the club. I was. Uh, we, we have um, uh, quite a good simulator, and I was quite surprised with how useful it was. As a, I called it a procedural trainer. It was very good for the. Um, pre-flight planning you can simulate the pre-flight preparation you can simulate what you're thinking about on the toe you're simulating what you should be thinking about simulating how what threat and management points you can think about you can see what lines you're going to fly you can see where your head should be but the big thing a simulator doesn't give you is that load factor a g um and actually stick force you know the one i was flying does have stick force not but it's never going to be accurate it's never going to be like the airplane so yes, you can use it as a procedural train. It gives you all the niceties, um, but it's got to be a good simulator. Um, you know, the one that I was in, you could actually look to the wingtips, you could see the angle. So as a procedural trainer to, to get used to using your head, get used to where your head should be looking, getting used to what you should be thinking about on the toe, what threat and error management issues you should be using, perfect, but absolutely no substitute for then getting in the airplane to feel the feel the load factor. We haven't got any more questions at the moment, unless anyone's going to type any now. Have you looped a T20S? Yes. Um, I'm just going to make sure. Uh, da -da. Oh, he's not in this chat, but I will incriminate him. I used to be um, uh, a course instructor with a chap at Dunstable, and we. Um, it was just after I. Oh, what was I? I don't know. Just got my my license and took a T20 up. So I'm going to now completely contradict what I've just said to Nicholas. I think you asked if I'd looped an old glider. Yes, I have looped a T21, um, and actually. I, you know, thought we were big tough men going and looping a glider that, you know, is old and, you know, it's really easy a loop, isn't it? But both of us completely, completely uh, were scared out of our wits. There's something about having a bit of perspex in front of you that's quite reassuring. Um, but yeah, I have looped a T21. Will I do it again? Probably not. Probably more out of respect for the age of the wing spa. Um, yeah, I think they're probably good for uh, floating around on a nice summer's evening rather than that. But yes, I have done, yeah. Still somebody typing, you've got a few thank yous now. Shall I open this, Lisa? Am I going to get the Q&A? Shall I press Q&A or chat? Or? If, you, if you press Q&A mode, um, yes. you can publish publish any questions that people put up. But Oh, okay, excellent. Is it, do I need to press anything for a chat? I don't think so, no. Nicholas, so what gliders... Um, what gliders can you use? Again, uh, refer to the flight manual if you've got one that you think you can use. Um, off the top of my head, that most clubs have a K twenty one is the um, is the standard one. Get a get a K get a K twenty one up there. Um, PW sixes are useful. Don't think there's many of those around though. Um, you can use, um, but really no substitute for a a K twenty one with with big uh, certainly standard aerobatics going forward. Um, Twin of Steel, I, I seem to remember, I've got that at the back of my head that I did it in that. Uh, I may be dreaming, but I have done one in, in a Twin of Steer. Um, I've done an aerobatic rating in a Percoge, done one in a Puchaz. So, yeah, there's a fair variety of aeroplanes you can use. Uh, 
I can't remember who asked the question about the usage of the fox, but Dan Dan Weston actually um, has just answered that in uh, in the chat. So whoever was asking that question, you can see it in there. I would actually add um, if you what gliders can you use? Someone's uh, David's actually put in the here, Perkosh with short wings. Uh, it's got adjustable wings. I think it still actually is certified up to unlimited with the winglets. If you put the short wings on, like uh, Dave was saying, it's a very, very, very responsive aeroplane. Not quite as bad. Not quite as bad. Quite not as uh, not quite as responsive as a Fox or a Swift, but it's pretty close. Um, I flick rolled a, a Perkosh a few times as a short tips, and it is brilliant representation of it. It's a great aeroplane to use. So. Um, Perkosh is a very good uh, cross country and very good at aerobatics. <laughs> 